quiet, check. Cool background, check. Nice table to put my computer on, check. I think we might have a home study studio. Since we started doing this Ask Homesteady segment here in PA, I've been looking for a good spot to set up every week where I could leave, you know, the wires attached and a camera mount and just go. So it's easy every week to do this. And uh, I've tried the barn, I've tried outside, all kinds of different stuff. But this area is well lit, it's quiet, pretty cool backdrop, you know, interesting visual. I think this might be our Ask Homesteady official studio for the next, you know, who knows how long. This is in the house we'll be moving into, so maybe we'll just convert it into a cool podcasting studio. I mean, keep the workbench, of course, because like, you need a good little workshop. Anyway, let's get into your questions. Before you buy pigs from someone, what questions should you ask them to make sure they're a good source for pigs? Should you buy a young milk doling or a doe that's already in milk when you're purchasing a milk goat? And why will I not get an LGD, a livestock guardian dog? We're gonna answer those questions and a whole lot more in today's episode of Ask Home Study. This is our weekly video where we answer your questions that you've left right here on our YouTube channel. If you wanna get a question answered, it's not too difficult. All you have to do is leave your question in the comments below of any of our videos from the previous week and put the hashtag Ask Home Study all one word along with it. Otherwise, we will not be able to find your question. And thank you so much as usual to our Homesteady super fans who will add the Ask Homesteady hashtag to questions new viewers ask. Some of the questions today only made it on here thanks to our super fans. Thank you very much. We're gonna dive right in today and get into some great questions about homesteading. So let's, let's do it, first question. We can all feel the change in the temperature outside. We're starting to see leaves coming down. I hate to say it, it's technically still August, but fall is almost here. And right after fall, I know we're gonna skip right over my favorite season of all, uh, winter is going to be here. And that means preparing for the long, cold, snowy winter. And Tessie with a T asks, what kinds of things do you need to do to prepare for winter with farm animals? What kind of snow season will you have at the new farm? Tessie, we will have probably a brutal snow season here at the new farm. We moved from Connecticut to Pennsylvania, and as far as changes in the weather go, there's gonna be a lot of snow. In Connecticut, we always got bad winters, so nothing new there, Tessie. Uh, but here in Pennsylvania, because of our location, we can actually get some, not exactly lake effect, but it's like lake effect, lake effect snow. Essentially, we can get bad, bad snow seasons because of what comes off of the Great Lakes and other issues with local weather. So we could get pounded here. And because we now live kind of up on a hill, higher elevation, we'll get more there. We have a longer, scarier driveway to maintain. So this will be an interesting year. Our car does not have four wheel drive. So that's an issue we're dealing with right now. But what are we doing to get farm animals ready? That's what you really wanna know. The first thing you need to think about with all your animals and winter approaching is obviously where are you gonna keep your animals to make sure that they are dry and they are warm and you can be dry and warm when taking care of them. Not all animals need to be inside of a barn. For example, our cows, when we purchased them, the breeder told us that if it is hailing during a blizzard, you might wanna bring your cows inside. Cows have a rumen, it's essentially an oven, it's creating heat and it keeps them warm all winter long. They grow a nice thick coat throughout the winter, which they should shed in the summer uh, if they're nice and healthy, but by winter time it will be back. So our cows don't need to come inside. However, if we're going to milk our cows, that is a lot more pleasant to do inside in a barn where you're not getting snowed on and you're out in the trudging through the snow and in the cold. Plus, you're going to be giving them, uh, taking care of them, brushing them. So just taking care of your animals, it's nice to have a place to come inside, even if the animals don't need to be inside. 
A lot of animals do though, however, need to be inside during the winter time. We will keep our goats in a stall, we will keep our chickens in a stall, and we'll even keep a free stall open, which you'll see next week we're cleaning up for it now. Uh, we'll keep a stall free for the cows should the weather be brutal. We don't want to make them be out in the cold if they don't have to be during the brutal times. However, it is better for them to stay outside most of the time throughout the winter, less work, less cleaning, better for them to be outside where they belong, unless the weather's really bad. So just first off, you have to make sure you have the right housing for animals in the winter. One area you can get into trouble if you run chickens in a chicken tractor, thinking, oh, this is great, they're eating grass and they're eating bugs. When the grass turns to snow, the chicken tractor no longer wants to move and the floor is not insulated. Your chickens can get frostbite in their feet and they can get frostbite in their combs. Make sure you have a warm coop or barn to keep smaller animals like chickens in throughout the winter. In addition to housing, you need to think about feed. What are you going to do to feed your chickens and your cows and your goats all winter long? The animals that you're generally buying feed for, make sure you keep more feed on hand. That way if a big blizzard comes and you're snowed in, you don't run out of feed and have to get to the store in the middle of a storm. That's not good. So make sure you buy bulk feed and have a nice dry warm place to store that feed. N not like hot warm, just a nice dry place to store your feed is all you need. The biggest and most stressful thing of all dealing with when you're wintering animals, especially animals like pigs, is water. Water in the winter time is a big problem. It will freeze, pipes can burst, Frozen water means you can't water your animals and when they don't get water, they don't produce and eventually die. Make sure you've planned long ahead how you're going to water animals. You do not want to be carrying five gallon buckets from your house through the snow to your animals, especially for larger livestock. They need a steady supply, lots of water, even through the winter. We make sure at all our homesteads, this one and the last one, that there are frost-free hydrants installed. You can run water lines out to your animal's area, put in a frost-free hydrant. They drip back down into the ground after you shut them off so they don't freeze. And you have good water on tap anytime you need it. Have one at every barn, every outbuilding, every paddock you will be planning on using through the winter. The less hauling of five gallon buckets, the more you will enjoy homesteading in the wintertime. One year we had to haul buckets and it was the worst. We wanted to quit, so don't mess with that. In addition to making sure that the water, ha you have access to water right where your animals are, when you put it in a trough, you wanna make sure that it doesn't freeze. So you can get uh, freeze proof, watering buckets for both chickens and cows and goats. This works well for almost all your animals. The hardest homestead animal, in my opinion, to deal with during the winter is pigs. Pigs do not put on weight during the winter very easily because they're putting on, they're burning up their calories to keep themselves warm. Pigs are very hard to water. A heated bucket they will destroy, they will rip the wires out of, they will make a total mess of it. We always water our pigs to a nipple waterer, but those are hard to keep from freezing. You could do that electric tape, heat tape on it, but that's kind of scary. Uh, you can hang heat lamps, but that's super expensive. I suggest never wintering pigs. If you're doing pigs, just do feeder pigs and be done and do not raise feeder pigs through the winter. I don't care if someone's giving them away on Craigslist for free. The reason they're giving them away is because they know it's better to not have pigs than try to raise pigs through the winter. So just avoid it altogether. One thing you might want to consider if you're going to be homesteading through a long winter is plan to do animals and homestead endeavors that are lighter and easier through the winter. So what do I mean by that exactly? Let's go back to pigs. I never want to be a source of feeder pigs because I know if I'm selling lots of pigs, I need to keep a boar and a sow over the winter. I actually need to keep a couple sows over the winter if I'm gonna be a, a feeder pig source, somebody who sells little piglets for other farmers and other homesteaders. Keeping pigs in the winter is not something I wanna do. So instead, I just buy feeders. Let's change it over to other animals like my goats. I do not want to raise a lot of goats because I don't wanna care for a lot of goats through the winter. I'll keep breeding stock here at the homestead, but I will sell off lots of the young kids 
before winter comes. Chickens. I like focusing more on meat chickens than egg layers. Now, my kids like doing the egg layers. As you've seen in the videos this week, we're going to keep doing egg layers. But I prefer to do meat chickens because you raise them through, through the hot time of the year and then you butcher them all and you have no chickens to care for through the winter. Meat animals are good like that. Anytime you do feeders, meat animals, generally you can start them in the spring and in the fall and then make sure your winter is a little bit easier. I always like winter to be a time of a little bit of a reprieve from the he real heavy constant work of homesteading. It's a good time to feel like you got a little bit of a break. I find if you have way too much work to do through the winter and you're not, your infrastructure is not set up for it, you get frustrated very easy and those are generally the years that you want to quit homesteading because you didn't get a nice break by the fire reading a nice book about you know farming or pigs or whatever. You're into science fiction? I loved Ender's Game. Whatever floats your boat. So try to make winters easier on your own homestead. We do that by making sure we choose animals that we will have less of through the winter, uh, endeavors that can go away through the winter, making sure the proper infrastructure is there, and planning smartly for winter. Despite the fact we don't want it to come, it will come. So be sure to plan for it. I hope that helps, Tessie. Ben asks, what program do we use to edit our videos? I use Adobe Premiere. It is a very professional editing program. You don't need to use Premiere. It's kind of scary at first. However, if you're going to do a daily vlog, I suggest you use how to use something like Premiere because once you know how to use all the tools that are with it, you'll never be able to go back to the simpler things. But if you've never used it before, start on something simpler and work your way up once you learn the basic principles. Lizzie G wants to know, how would you train a puppy to stay by your side without introducing separation anxiety to him? Good question, Lizzie. You don't want your puppy to be afraid to run and play away from you, especially if you're raising a dog like I am that's gonna be a field dog, a bird dog. Uh, the dog has to be confident. So what I like to do to teach a dog to stay by my side is have a command that tells the dog, at this point I need you to stay by my side, and then have a command that releases the dog from that duty. So, I teach my labs heal. I teach them when I say heel, they need to be right by my side. And I've trained Bones heel with an, Eng an English lead. It is a very short leash that I can keep him right by my side. And he knows when I say heel, he's to be right next to me, practically bumping up against my leg, not getting ahead of me, not getting behind me. And when I've said the word heel, he knows he needs to stay there until I release him. I taught him this by putting that short leash on him saying the word heel, and as we walk forward, if he starts to drift ahead or behind, giving him a strong tug on the English lead back to me and, and reaffirming the command, heel. If he starts to drift, heel, right back to me. Now, when I want him to realize he can go and play, and it's okay to go and play, it's a good thing, I then tell him, okay. Okay is my release word for all my commands. The minute he hears the word okay, he knows he can stop listening or paying attention to me and just go and play. So teaching him the command to stay by your side is very nice, especially once you get it to the point where you no longer need that leash. Let's say you're out and about and something dangerous happens, another dog shows up that you don't know and you're not sure what to expect. All you have to say is heal, he'll come right back to your side, he'll be there until you release him, even off leash. And for bones, it works really, really well. Start teaching him with that English lead and you can graduate long distance reinforcement with an e-collar. Uh, of course, if you're going to use an e-collar for training a dog, you need to know how to do that the right way. You're not trying to hurt your dog with an electric shock. Uh, there are e-collars that are adjustable and we could cover that in a future video, how to train your dog. But first and foremost, you have to teach them there without an e-collar. Make sure they know the command, understand it. And then as they get further away from you without a leash, you could work with a check cord, which is longer, or eventually the e-collar. You work your way up through all that, making sure the dog understands your commands and that he'll always come to your side without having separation anxiety. Good question. Speaking of dogs, Jackie, in addition to a few other people, have asked this question this week. Since you're going to put animals out to pasture away from your home, have you ever thought about using livestock guardian dogs since you now know that you have predators? We run six dogs on our property that protect our chickens, 
ducks, horses, cattle, pigs, and whatever critters we have. Good question, Jackie. I have no plans in the immediate future to get livestock guardian dogs. I have nothing against LGDs. They seem like a great thing for a large farm to use, but I don't think LGDs are the right solution for most homesteaders, actually. When we think of an LGD, livestock guardian dog, generally they're used on large farms with a big pastoral operation where your sheep and your goats can go uh, the family across the way, the, the neighbors here have some LGDs on their property. And they are a nice solution to making sure there's no predators on your property, uh, protecting your flock. But I think there was a bit of a LGD bubble a few years back when they became really popular. Everybody who owned four chickens went out to get an LGD and found out that it probably wasn't a good fit. So here's why we have not and will not in the near future get an LGD. First, I don't think our operation is big enough uh, where that makes sense for us. An LGD is a big expense. I spend a lot of money when I purchase a dog. I make sure it's good quality breeder with a good quality stock. Uh, I make sure that this is gonna be the right fit for our farm. When you purchase a good quality dog, you wanna make sure that you take good care of that dog, which is good quality feed, going to the vets, getting your checkups, getting your shots, and then, in addition to money, there's a huge time investment in training a dog. So an LGD, despite the fact that they have been bred for this trait, like all animals, just because they've been bred for something doesn't mean they're going to be good at it unless you also train them to be good at it. My labs, well, Bones, the one right now, is a great farm bird dog combination, but he Although he has the genetics there to be that, he's also that way because I've spent hours upon hours training him. LGDs are no different. You can't just buy an LGD and then set it loose with your flock. You have to train that dog to be the guardian. It's going to be easier to train an LGD than a lab to do the guardian work or to train an LGD versus maybe a pit bull to do that work because they have the genetics, but they still will need training, which is time and I have so much time. The dog I want to have in my homestead is the dog I have. A dog that is multi-purpose, farm dog, uh, security, field work, hunting dog. First and foremost, I want a good family dog. Second to that, I want a good hunting field dog. And then third to that, I want a dog on the property because just having a dog will keep some predators from coming too close. Having a dog peeing all around the barn, barking at things at night, is a good presence. And we have always found having a lab whose presence is outside, especially at night, keeps predators from getting too close to you, your house, your barn, your animals. This will not work up on the hill. If we go and put animals up on the hill, the lab will not be up on the hill with them. I can't leave my labs with the animals as an LGD. But I don't have that many animals going up on the hill where it would make sense for me to spend that kind of money and time training and getting and training an LGD. There's not enough animals up there that even need that. The cows do not need an LGD. Ladybug is like an LGC. She's a livestock guardian cow. She will kill any predators that come into her paddock and she is perfectly capable of doing that. I would even not worry about a bear, honestly, because Ladybug would get ferocious. A bear would probably win, but a bear's not gonna mess with our cow. The smaller dog-like, you know, foxes and coyotes are gonna be run off by her. Even larger goats can do that be protective of the smaller livestock. So instead of using an LGD, I have my large livestock. And then if I put ducks or chickens out with them, I'll make sure we have the electric fence around the perimeter and our bigger livestock to kind of keep those predators at bay and the presence of a dog. It just doesn't check out the time and the expense to get an LGD for what we're doing. If I was primarily running a flock of sheep and I had lots of lambs that needed lots of care, and we're young and we're getting picked off by predators, or if I was doing all pastured poultry and I just had a huge pastured poultry thing going on up in the field and no larger livestock, then I might consider an LGD, especially if it was for my business, because then it's a business expense, it's a write-off and all of that. 
But as far as it goes, I think most homesteaders, instead of using an LGD, if you just have a few animals, you're better off making sure your fences are good, having a little bit of a solar power electric out there. You don't have to feed it, you don't have to water it, you don't have to train it, it just works. And have a family dog, if you have a dog on the farm, something that'll bark at predators at night. You don't need to go and get a great Pyrenees, you know, to protect your coop of 10 chickens. Maybe someday in the future we'll get to the point where it makes sense. Sounds like they're working great for you, Jackie. Sound, they're great animals and it would be fun to have one, but we only have so much time, attention, and money, and right now those are better spent on other animals. I love how the questions kind of flow together sometimes. Art wanted to know how does Kay's aunt, who has that herd over the hill, control worms in her large goat herd? Could you do an interview with her? So that would be excellent, talking to uh, Kay's aunt about worm control. As far as worm control goes, we did the series on how we handle worms on our homestead. And with a larger flock or herd, I'm not speaking about a flock that's like huge, like running a giant business, but a larger herd like what you see they have over the hill. You still want to make sure you're treating parasites and worms uh, specifically for animals who need it which means you just need to be paying attention to your herd. If you have a big herd, you need to every day be laying eyes on them. It's bad practice, bad deworming management uh, to just treat the whole herd, medicated feeds, uh, giving everybody a routine wormer. That's what can build up a resistance in the parasites. If you focus on just treating the animals who need it instead of treating the whole herd because it's cheap and it's just something you do routinely, you're going to be better off making sure that you're only killing the worms you need to be and not building up a resistance in animals who are doing fine. And so for a larger herd, you just need to be paying more attention to all the animals in general. Usually if you have a larger herd, that is a business. And if it's your business, you are going to be paying good attention to the health of your animals because if they die, your business is dying a little bit with each animal's death. So, yep, same way you would treat your own little flock, just takes more time and more attention. The Hunger Goats, which is one of my favorite farm names I've seen on this channel yet. Do you do your own deer processing or do you have a processor in your area you like to use? I do all my own deer processing. I always have. I've never had a butcher process my deer. There are very few butchers who can take the time they need to make and make the money they need to do a deer the correct way. I have a very special treat coming this fall. I filmed my butcher from back home who did all my pigs processing a deer the perfect way. He would not do it for business because it took too long. He'd have to charge too much money and nobody would want to pay that. But he teaches you in that video how to process a deer perfectly. It's the method I've been using for years, but he's a butcher so he's obviously better at it. And we'll be releasing that in the fall when deer season comes and people are actually interested in butchering deer. So stay tuned for that video. Taryn wants to know how many cups of latte do you drink daily? Not enough, Taryn. Not enough. Probably on average three. Jeanette, Johnette, is it possible to eat root vegetables like garlic and potatoes straight out of the ground? What are the benefits of curing? Jeanette uh, watched our garlic harvest video from a few weeks back. We talked about curing garlic. You can eat garlic right out of the ground. It's delicious. Same with potatoes. Obviously you want to wash them off first, but you can eat them right away. Curing is just what helps them last. So you're drying them out. Moisture will destroy vegetables over time. So you cure garlic. If you're going to keep it a long period of time, you hang it and you dry it out and that helps it keep. Uh, that's what curing does for anything. It's removing the moisture, which will have something spoil. But you can definitely eat garlic and potatoes. Just rinse them off, get them clean. One of the best treats of a garlic harvest is throwing a little of that fresh garlic in your food that night because it's delicious. And my mother-in-law's garlic, it's great gar great garlic. Ooh, that was a tongue twister. Great garlic. Be a good euphemism. <laughs> a little bit more on dog training. Chad says, why does it take you so long to train your puppy? My German Shepherd is 12 weeks. She listens to just about every command I give her. The only thing I'm having problems with is she keeps licking. Other than that, she's a great puppy. So I talked about in our dog training video not too long ago, we wait till the puppy teeth are gone uh, to do any advanced training. Now, Chad, I don't know what you're teaching your German Shepherd. Uh, my puppy, which we'll do a video soon to show this, she is now 
well, she, we got her at eight weeks, so she's probably 12 weeks, maybe a little bit older than 12 weeks. She knows what crate is, uh, so the crate command. Uh, we've taught her that. We teach her basic manners. Uh, but I don't go into any advanced training because just like with, you know, children and teenagers and young adults, it's easier to teach more difficult things to, there's that sweet spot in between a baby and like a 20 year old where the training gets a little bit easier. And we have found based off advice from books and trainers I've worked with that once they lose their puppy teeth, they're ready to take on more. It's a good sign that they're mentally closer to being able to handle harder concepts. And I find with training, a big part is not getting frustrated. So I wanna work with an animal that's ready for it so I don't get frustrated. Even if a younger puppy could handle some of the stuff we're gonna throw it at, if, if it's not all there and I get frustrated, then it's just not gonna be a nice time. So most of the puppy period, we don't focus on really specific training. Now we teach our dogs complicated tasks like for example, Bones knows casting routines. He can go to the left, he can go to the right, he can go back. Those are the kind of things I wait to teach till the dog is older. But once that happens, it's full on and we will we'll be showing you updates with Poppy as the season goes. And hopefully by this winter, we'll be able to actually hunt over Poppy, which would be awesome. I've never worked a dog that quickly, but the breeder I got her from assured me that we could move her along that quick because she is a smart, driven pup. So that should be fun to see. Go and check out Farmer Brad's channel, Farmer Brad LLC. He has a YouTube channel he's trying to grow and he, Farmer Brad has some awesome, awesome ideas. The things he does with chicken waterers and chicken housing and just, he's, he's a guy who never stops thinking and creating and some of his ideas are just so dynamite. So go check out Farmer Brad if you have chickens or livestock, you'll learn a lot from his videos. He asks if we are going to Mother Earth News Fair, there's one in Seven Springs, PA, and if we knew any places to stay slash visit during that time and area. Uh, Farmer Brad, I'm not sure if we're going yet. Uh, we have been talking about it. Comment below if you're thinking on going to Seven Springs, Mother Earth News Fair, and if you are, if a lot of our audiences, maybe we'll plan a homestead meetup. As far as any places to stay slash visit during that time, uh, I can't suggest anywhere to stay because every time we came here, we stayed with family. We're not in Seven Springs. We're not too far though. It's Western Pennsylvania. Uh, so I, I'm afraid I can't help you out there. Uh, places to visit in Western PA, Pittsburgh is a sleeper city. There's a really cool food district where there's a lot of good local food and just delicious stuff. So check out Pittsburgh. There's some great museums. I like the uh, Carnegie Museum. We've taken our kids there a few times. There's also uh, Ligonier, the town of Ligonier it has a historic fort. So if you can travel out to Ligonier and that uh, historic fort, they have a big event that happens every year in October. We've been to that, that's pretty cool. Um, other than that, uh, we haven't seen a whole lot touristy stuff because we always came to visit family. So check those two things out, Farmer Brad, tell me what you think. And if you're thinking of going to Mother Earth News Fair, and you'd like to do a homesteady meetup, comment below and if enough people are, maybe we'll go and we'll do a meetup. Robin is planning on adding pigs to her family's homestead next spring. That's awesome, I love pigs. Everyone knows they're my favorite homestead animal to raise myself. When choosing a pig breeder, I was wondering what questions I should be asking. Awesome question, Robin. I thought of this question because just this last week we were at a agricultural fair and I too am looking for a new pig breeder. My good old Tom Dexter from Connecticut is no longer within a local radius to me where it would make sense to get pigs from him. If you're in Connecticut, just call Tom Dexter. If you're near Connecticut, call Tom Dexter. I can put you in contact with him if you email me, Austin, this is Homesteady. But what I would suggest, go to an agricultural fair in your area, if there is one, you'll find a ton of breeders there. Those people showing pigs are serious pig breeders. It's gonna be much better than the lot you'll find maybe on Craigslist, just somebody who wound up with a couple extra piglets or something. Uh, people who show livestock care about their livestock and they care to have quality livestock. Now that doesn't mean you wanna buy show quality pigs or any other livestock. A lot of times what they breed for for shows is not exactly what a homesteader wants, but a good breeder can tell you whether or not they have what you're looking for. So a good source to look for 
pigs is at a fair or finding, you know, through people who are involved in 4-H, uh, people who are serious about breeding quality livestock. What do you want to ask them? Well, I actually thought about you as I was talking to these people at the agricultural fair we went to because I saw your question and it was in my mind while I was talking to them. The first thing I just asked them was what breeds they had. I could see they had pink pigs. I like raising pink pigs. They also had Durox. I wanted to make sure they were breeding smartly, making sure they were picking the right breeds that I like. So I just asked them, what do you raise? What do you cross? Why? A lot of times you'll find the pink pigs, sometimes they cross them with Berkshires to get a little bit more a ham, or maybe they'll cross with a different pig for a specific reason. I don't mind buying for feeders crosses. A lot of times if you're buying feeders, crosses are a good thing because they can breed, take two purebreds and cross them for specific traits which for feeders work really good and because you're just raising feeders you're not breeding them yourself you don't worry about them being crosses so find out what they're breeding and why find out if they're breeding a pig for meat development if you're raising pigs for meat obviously you want a pig that's long a pig that grows nice big muscles i don't care to grow a super lean pig because i like having a lot of fat on my pig adds more flavor that said, I don't want a pig that's too much fat. Some animals can be too lean. Some animals can be mostly fat. And then you're paying the butcher to butcher meat you're not going to eat because you don't eat much of the fat. So you want to find that sweet spot. An animal that's not super lean, but that's not mostly fat. Make sure that animal is being bred for meat purposes, if that's what you're planning on using your pigs for. Then ask the breeder, are they going to deworm the pigs for you. They should give the pig a round of shots before you get them. That should not be your responsibility. You can do another treatment of dewormer if you choose to. In the past, we never dewormed our pigs. We got them dewormed and then we had plenty of time to uh, let those chemicals pass through their system and be out of the meat by the time we got them to the butcher. Only once we did have to give pigs antibiotics for pneumonia and again, we had plenty of time to get that out of their system. So make sure they'll do the deworming for you. Another thing you want to make sure is that they cut the boars. Boar taint can give a funny smell slash flavor to your meat. Not all people can detect boar taint. There's a small percentage of people who can and the rest of us can't. But if you are the unfortunate small percent that can detect boar taint, which is just a weird musky odor associated with the hormones that a boar who still has his testicles uh, that will be in the meat. You will get that musky odor from the meat and you will not want to eat it. And you'll have 200 pounds of pork that essentially gets wasted. So make sure they cut the boars. If they tell you, no, we don't cut them, we've never had any problems with boar taint, maybe they don't taste or smell that themselves and maybe you do and that's not a gamble I'm willing to take. Russian boar roulette is not something I want to play. So make sure they cut the boars that means they are removing the testicles and they should do that before you get the pigs. You do not want to be cutting your own pigs. You do not want to be giving pig shots. It's not a big deal, but it's just not something you should have to do. And you want to make sure they're the right breed. Also, make sure that the breeder can promise you what you want. Some breeders will have a good plan for the year. They're going to breed this month and they'll have them ready for this month and, and they'll be ready for pickup this exact week for you. Other people are kind of like, let nature happen, and they're not sure what they're going to get or when. So ask them, are you going to have pigs this, the end of May, the you know end of April? Uh, can I get on a list ahead of time for a set number? I want to have six pigs at the end of April. Can you do that? Some of them will say, no, I don't know when I'm going to have pigs. Others will say, yep, I'll put you on the list, but you better call me in February because I sell out quickly. That's the breeder you want to buy from. Somebody who can tell you for sure they're gonna have the pigs you want and they will have them when you want them. Once you've asked all those questions, ask to go see the farm. You should see the source. Make sure you're happy with it. Make sure the animals look healthy. You like the way that they're raised. Uh, make sure it's a good choice for you. If the person doesn't want you to see their farm, you don't know what they're hiding if they don't want you to see the farm. Maybe they're just really private and they're not hiding anything, but I don't want to do business with someone who won't let me come and take a look at the place. And if you're new to pigs, they should be encouraging you, much like Tom Dexter did with us so many years ago. 
making sure that you understand what you're getting into. It's good for a breeder to have customers coming back every year and they're only gonna do that if they're successful and they're only gonna be successful if they have help from a good mentor. Tom Dexter was an incredible source for pigs. He was a great pig mentor and he made sure seven years ago that here I am still loving pigs and wanting to raise pigs and a little bit bummed I didn't get any this year. Don't you worry, I found a good source at the local agricultural fair and next spring there will be pigs on the PA farm here because I love raising feeder pigs. And Robin, I think based off the fact that you're asking this question, you're planning, you already said you're planning ahead. I think you're gonna love pigs too because people who plan ahead for pigs and make smart decisions, enjoy them. People who get pigs on a whim find themselves overwhelmed, frustrated, and probably will never do them again. Jennifer sees that we live in New England. No, we don't, Jennifer. We moved out of that place three months ago, but she's watching an old video. This is my first winter with my Orpington chicks. She lives in Mass. The chicks will be 12 weeks old around Thanksgiving. Would you heat your coop? Jennifer, good question. I do sometimes heat the coop throughout the winter. Depending on the cold of the winter and depending on the, the insulative properties of my coop. Chickens don't need a heated coop all winter long as long as the coop is reasonably warm. The area you can get in trouble, those coops that are up off the ground, a lot of times will get a really cold chill on the bottom. If you don't have enough bedding, uh, that can be bad. Plus, your chicks are going to be 12 weeks old. At 12 weeks old, your chickens are close to being full-grown adult chickens, so uh, they'll start laying around 20 to 24 weeks. At that point, they don't need heat uh, for their development, but if it is very cold in your coop, like we said, if it's not insulated on the floor, uh, you might consider adding a little bit of heat to this coop, especially if it's cold. Thanksgiving is not gonna be probably too cold, but as the year gets further and further along, you might wanna throw something in there. I've seen homesteaders using ceramic heat bulbs as opposed to those big red ones. Uh, the best case is just find a space where they're on the ground and you can put a good layer of bedding and then usually you can get away with not having to put any heat at all, but keep a close eye on your flock and once in a while you might find you need to add a little bit of something. This is a great question. Catherine kind of piggybacked onto a question we talked about last week. I'm wondering if your advice on buying a cow versus a calf, so that's what we talked about last week. I said I would much more suggest that someone buy a cow in milk or a cow that's going to be in milk soon who has already been trained to milk, like Ladybug, versus buying a calf. And the reason why was when you buy a cow who's already used to being milked, you're not gonna have to teach her. You're new to this, she's not. You can learn, she already knows what to do. That'll make your learning curve quicker, better. It'll just work all nicely. You'll be able to know if you're buying a cow that's actually a good milker because if she's already milked, you can ask how's her temperament with milking. If people are like, oh, she's okay, she kicks once in a while, that means she's bad, don't get her. If people are like, oh, she's a dream to milk, that's who you wanna buy, buy a cow that's a dream to milk. That way you can learn, she already knows what to do, it'll be really smooth, and you'll be getting a product right away. Homesteading, there's a lot to learn and a lot to do, and it can be very frustrating if you're spending a bunch of money and time and you're not getting anything in return. As you get to be a better homesteader and better with animals and gardening and all that other stuff, you learn patience. It's like taking a kid fishing. When you take a kid fishing, you wanna have him catch a bunch of easy fish first. You get them on sunnies and bluegills because he can catch like 20 of them. Sure, they're not trophy fish, you're not super excited when you've been fishing for 20 years to catch a sunny, probably, but you've learned patience and you've learned that sometimes if you wanna catch better fish, you're not gonna catch fish. A new homesteader needs a quick win. If you're getting goats, I suggest the exact same thing, Catherine. Get a doe who has already been trained to milk, who's a good milker, preferably one who's pregnant and going to soon kid and then give you milk, or even better, one who is in milk when you purchase her so you can taste her milk and try milking her. The best way to shop for a goat, find a goat who's in milk and say, before I buy her, I'd like to milk her. Come to the farm in the morning, bright and early at milking time, and milk the goat. Milk her, see how she does, see how much she gives, taste the milk, 
that's the best, safest way to buy a goat. Now, you'll get a quick win. So here you get this goat to your homestead. You're gonna be learning about caring for livestock and learning about how to feed them and how to care for them. You'll learn the inadequacies of your fencing because you bought a goat. And you'll learn about, you know, all this beginner learner's curve stuff. But meanwhile, your goat every day will get up on the milking stand, let you milk her, and you'll have delicious milk. And when you're frustrated or you're tired or you're bummed because you wanted to go to the movies but you can't because you have to go and put your goats in at night, at least every day you'll be enjoying a glass of milk. And that'll help you get used to becoming a homesteader to the point where you'll get to the, you know, the point where you don't even want to go to the movies because you want to care for your goats and then you just enjoy being on your farm. Unless the movie is, you know, the new Jurassic Park, which we all get. You got to go see the new Jurassic Park in theaters. Otherwise, you're missing out on the real experience. If you get a doling, you have to wait till that doling is old enough to be bred, and then you have to wait three more months of gestation, and then, only then, will you get her on a milk stand to learn that she needs to be trained to milk, she'll be kicking, you'll have to put her in a hobble, or hobble her, I don't know the right phrase, how do you phrase that right? You'll have to hobble her, I think is the way to say that. Uh, which is frustrating and annoying and it's you're just going to be annoyed and constantly frustrated and then also maybe disappointed in the amount of milk you're getting or the flavor or the quantity or quality buy a doe in milk or one that has already been in milk who will soon be back in milk and that is going to be the best way to learn it's like a gardener buying a already started plant. If you're a new gardener, buy transplants. Don't try to start from seeds. If you're taking kids fishing, put them on sunnies because it's easy. Get a quick, easy win under your belt. And then you'll breed your doe, have more kids, and already having experience having raised and cared, not raised, but having cared for goats, fed them, watered them, fenced them, housed them, milked them, now you'll be able to train these dolings to your process, which you now have thanks to the fact that you bought a goat already in milk. That is the way to do it. I would never suggest you get young ones. People will disagree with me. Others have done it differently. I've done it both ways. I've bought young and ones in milk, and I can tell you the best experiences we have had when it comes to uh, milk animals is buying ones that have already been trained for you, are good quality, good milkers and you just have a nice smooth transition learning how to do it yourself. Leanna Hayden wants to know how was that foraging tour? You know the foraging tour we got I'm gonna be honest while super charismatic and funny our guide did not exactly seem to know what we were looking at or what we were looking for. This is a tree I left him a review on Yelp. I would not suggest taking the Accounted Mike foraging tour. <laughs> we had so much fun with, that's Accounted Mike's wife, and we had so much fun with them visiting. We're, I, I wish we could have him on the channel. Now we live far away, so it'll be different. But we'll get him on the channel again, I think through some Skype sessions or something, because you guys love the videos he made, and uh, it was a lot of fun having them here. I'm looking forward, they're gonna visit again before, hopefully before winter really sets in here. So we'll have more accounted Mike. Chicken Gal wants to know about goats. What is the favorite goat breed for meat? I don't like to breed, nope, breed's the wrong word. I don't like to raise goats specifically for meat. I like goat meat, but goats are the very rare animal on this homestead that you will find I actually choose to be dual purpose. Generally, something that is dual purpose does both poorly. Livestock have been bred for a single purpose. I shouldn't say a single purpose, but with a single purpose as its focus for you know decades. You look at these breeds that have been selected for this trait predominantly along with some other good ones. When you get a dual purpose animal, usually it does okay with one and okay with the other. And if you're trying to do a business, that's definitely not the way to go. But as a homesteader, sometimes you can say, you know what, I don't need the animal to do all the things great. I don't really like to eat chicken eggs and I don't really need a lot of chicken meat. So if I get a couple dual purpose hens that lay a few eggs and then maybe have a few chicken meals at the end of the year, I'm happy. 
the, that's one of those things where you can say, all right, I'll, I'll go with a dual purpose, even though it does neither great. I have seen the Nubian goats that are over the hill here that Kay's aunt is working with, the, the lines she has bred and bred and bred with. She has created a Nubian goat that will milk a gallon of milk a day. Nubian milk has a higher butterfat content, so it is more delicious milk. It's just yummier. And the bucks are huge. They are big, meaty, giant bucks. They are dual purpose homestead animals. I have been very impressed by with them. And despite how many times I've told you not to get goats and how annoying goats can be and I, they just drive me nuts and they get into trouble and whatever, every time I would see those goats I would be jealous because I'm like, mm, that is a dual purpose animal. It gives a gallon of milk and the males are just big, meaty giants. If you had a small herd of good quality Nubians, because not all Nubians are like this, you have to pick, don't focus on the breed, focus on the line. We talk about that a lot on this channel. If you get the right line, like the line that's over the hill here, you can get lots of meat off the males and lots of milk off the females. That is something that I think all homesteaders uh, would not all, but a lot of homesteaders would do well to bring onto their homestead. And you can keep goats easier than you can keep, for example, like sheep. The worming issues aren't so bad if you have good browse for them. They still are harder with the worm issue than, for example, like a cow, but they're somewhere in the intermediate zone. They're a nice, personable animal. They will be friendly. Our goats are very friendly. They're very, um, you know, like they become pet-like which if you're raising some for meat, you don't really want to get too close to those ones because you'll feel really sad when it's time to butcher them. But if you keep the does for milk and then the bucks for meat, that works out pretty well. I have tried other breeds. Obviously, when it comes to meat, boars are the go-to goat with meat in mind. Uh, Kiko goats, some people will raise for meat purposes, but we interviewed the guy who actually made that breed and his breeding stock was not selected for meat production first. It was just a byproduct of the animals that they were selecting. Uh, they are not like a boar, which is bred to be a big, fat, meaty thing. Problem with the boars, I've heard from lots of different people with good goat experience that boars are a hard animal to keep alive. You gotta worry a lot about caring for them, maintaining the parasites and things. So I've avoided boars just because I've heard nothing but bad things about them. And I see these Nubians, they are big, dual-purpose goats. I find it's better to pick one line, one breed, and stick with that on your homestead, not have a bunch of different breeds. So instead of having a bunch of boars for meat and a bunch of you know Nubians for milk or Alpines or older Hossies, I'd prefer to just find, when it comes to goats, the one dual-purpose because I've been so impressed by the quality of the dual purpose animal. A gallon of milk and a big meaty buck. That's why I have goats back on my property again. And we will be breeding these goats this coming fall to those lines over the hill. So those big meaty bucks are going to mate with our girls who are from dairy herds. And hopefully we'll be able to maintain that awesome dual purpose quality. We'll know probably in a year's time, we'll start to see the products of, of that breeding. And eventually our herds will be big enough where we'll actually be able to sell some livestock. And if you're interested, you'll be able to get on a waiting list for the homesteadies, you know, quality homestead livestock. Cause that's where we've, we've learned that livestock quality makes or breaks your homesteading experience. Don't buy cheap stuff, buy good stuff and that will make your life so much better on your homestead and you'll actually enjoy doing what you do. Shane saw a bunch of Japanese knotweed on the farm and he said, it's hard to get rid of, can be damaging to structures and it will take over a whole area in no time. Yeah, Shane, it's all over this area of Pennsylvania. We didn't bring it in. That is just, it's an invasive species in this area of Pennsylvania. I believe they brought it in for erosion purposes. It does do very well on a hillside and it will keep the hillside from eroding too much because it will take over and just, and it's hard to get rid of. However, the goats do eat it. So, you know, permaculture, the problem is the solution. Goats are a problem, they can also be a solution. They don't eat enough of it. 
Windy Acres Farm. I think I'm allergic to duck eggs too. They make my stomach hurt and sometimes make me sick. Is that what happens to you? Yeah, Windy Acres, sounds like you're allergic to duck eggs. If you eat something and it makes your stomach hurt and make you feel sick, I think they call that being allergic. <laughs> we uh, mentioned in a video last week that I don't eat duck eggs anymore because I'm allergic to them. I did not get tested for that. I just realized every time I ate duck eggs, my stomach hurt and I felt sick. I didn't need a doctor to tell me that I'm allergic to duck eggs. I figured that one out myself. Uh, and you sound like you are too, Windy Acres. Funny thing is, the way we learned this, we had a duck laying eggs, we were all excited, so we're eating the eggs, and I didn't even notice it the first time, maybe it took a couple duck egg meals. I started getting these regular stomach aches out of the blue, I just didn't know where they were coming from, and like really bad stomach aches, Not I'd be doubled over, I'd have to lay down, and I didn't put two and two together that it was after we had started adding duck eggs into our diet regularly. I remembered a home study fan of the podcast who wrote me after our duck episode of the podcast, which you can find a link below to our podcast. They wrote me and told me this story of how they found out they were allergic to duck eggs. They didn't realize it at first. They were eating duck eggs. They were getting these horrible stomach aches. They went to a doctor, got a bunch of testing done, couldn't figure out what was wrong with them, took duck eggs out of the diet, everything went away, put duck eggs back into the diet, boom, same problem back again. Well, we thought maybe I'm allergic to duck eggs. So we took duck eggs out of my diet. The stomach aches went away. One Sunday morning, without telling me, Kay slipped a duck egg back into the breakfast. I ate breakfast, delicious, thanks for breakfast, babe. An hour later, oh, what's wrong? My stomach's killing me. You didn't cook duck eggs, did you? She said, I just wanted to test. She was being a good scientist, you know, checking her hypothesis with a blind test. It's confirmed, duck eggs give me a stomach ache and make me sick. And if they do that to you, Windy Acres, don't eat duck eggs. It only gets worse. You're allergic to duck eggs. I don't play a doctor on YouTube, but put two and two together. This comment made uh, a lot of, oh, I'm actually not gonna do that one, Never mind. Never mind. not doing that one. We're gonna make a follow-up video on that one. You'll find out later what that is. Jocelyn wants to know how many animals do we have? What kind, how old are my little ones, human children? I counted this morning, we actually have about 40 chickens, and if you add the ducks into that, it's probably about 45 with the new ducklings. So we have about 45, and then the guineas brings that number up to like 55. So we have about 55 birds, we have two cows, we have two goats. So 55, we have about 60 animals here on the homestead, plus a couple dogs. We're up in the 60s for animals. As far as human children, there are four of those running around the homestead, ages eight, six, four, and two. Eight, six, four, and two. Yep, those are the, those are the numbers. Jackie, how do you keep your coop slash stall so clean of chicken and duck poop? Very impressive. I wish I could keep mine that clean. Jackie, we have a very large stall for the amount of birds that have been using it. However, you'll see next week we are confining them down to a single stall. More space just helps. Uh, lots of bedding. Some people use deep bedding. Uh, we use kind of like a, a deeper bedding, but we still clean it out. Uh, we don't clean it constantly though. Just more space and more shavings equals cleaner. Also, making sure the chickens are out early in the morning. Uh, the more time they spend outside, the cleaner the inside of the coop. They'll fly down, go right outside, and poop right outside, and you won't get much inside the coop. So ours are out early every day, and they're out all day long, and it just saves a lot of the coop mess. But the, the best tip is just having more space than you need for your birds keeps it cleaner. The more birds in a confined area, it just gets dirty faster. It's no special secret of how we're maintaining our coops, or we don't clean them crazy constantly. We just, you know, check on them. Um, just having this space. And this barn is, we're very fortunate. We have a very big barn with lots of space. But bringing the cows in for the winter is gonna change some of that. We're gonna be kind of cramping them. It'll be interesting to see how the chicken stalls look this winter with more confinement and less of them outside. So I ain't gonna get all braggy and be like, we're just that good because this winter you might be like, wow, it's really unimpressive how messy your coops are. 
Ashley, do you get paid more if I watch the whole ad and not hit that skip button? Yes, Ashley, if you watch the whole ad on our videos, we get paid more. We appreciate it for those of you who let the ads play. We get paid more for ads that play all the way through. I actually don't think we make any money if the ads are skipped. I could be wrong about that. Uh, I'm not up and up on how the YouTube works 100%, but I'm pretty sure if you skip the ad, we get, we get skipped paid. But that's not the primary way we fund this channel. The way we fund this channel, which I'll tell now and then we'll have our final question, so don't go away yet because we got one more question left and it's a good one. The way we fund this channel primarily is through the Homesteady Pioneer program. You can become a pioneer with the link below. It's $5 a month, which equals, with the amount of videos we put out, a quarter a video. Every day, if you come back here and you watch our videos, they're about 15, 20 minutes long. It's almost like you're watching an episode of something on television, except for the fact that it's not super lame and dumb like most of the things we watch on the television. There's a couple good shows out there, but like, how often do you watch television anymore? Because it's just like, ugh, garbage, garbage, garbage. Instead, you're coming here and you're watching our video. If you pay us five bucks a month, that's a quarter per episode. Is this experience, the videos we put together each week, is it worth a quarter to you? If it is, becoming a Homesteady Pioneer ensures it will keep going because we do not make enough money from YouTube's ads that they play. Most people do hit that skip button. We could not do this channel without the Homesteady Pioneers. And every, you know, Every month, a couple people become pioneers. It helps us keep doing keep doing this. If you can't, don't worry. We understand. If you're saving up every penny so you can get your future homestead, that's okay. But if you could do it, if you could give us a quarter per show, it would make the difference of us continuing this channel or saying, you know what, this isn't worth it. We can't feed our family with what we're making here. We got to finish. We got to be done. If you want this to continue for as long as I'm running a business, become a pioneer. That will help us keep doing this. There is no guarantee that we will do this channel forever. If nobody becomes a pioneer, we couldn't. We could not keep doing this channel. It's only the fact that people become pioneers and keep becoming pioneers that we can do this. That's the guarantee. So if you want this channel to not go away, become a Homesteady Pioneer. In return, you get bonus content. We Yesterday's video, there's an extended version. It's three times as long as the one that's on YouTube with Accountant Mike going super in depth on how to like get all your expenses figured out. There's classes that I used to teach at a school that people used to pay to go to. They'd pay 20 bucks to sit through this class. You get it for $5 a month along with everything else. There's discounts to homestead suppliers. If you're going to plant an orchard this year, you can get 10% off all your plants from our go-to orchard guy in uh, New Jersey there, Dave from Northeast Edible. He has awesome plants. He ships, so take advantage of those discounts. There's other discounts too. You can learn it all about becoming a pioneer in the link below. We cannot do the show without pioneers. So if you really wanna help us become a Homesteady Pioneer, or of course, you know, don't skip the YouTube ad, that does help too. Thank you for asking, Ashley. We love the support you have all been giving us. It's the only way we can do this. Those of you who didn't stop watching because I was talking about being the pioneer or whatever, you're in store for a treat because this question, I was, uh, I did a 180 on. The, the answer I was going to give you and the, the answer I'm actually going to give you and what I'm actually going to do it's totally different from what I thought I was going to say when I was preparing for this Q&A. Mr. Potato Head does ask questions from time to time, great questions, and uh, he's been on quite a few, few Q&As. Does soaking the feed reduce the amount needed by 30%? Could free running the chickens to enable them to forage for bugs and food scraps save on using feed? Great job, kid. So Mr. Potato Head watched the video from yesterday where we talked about how much money we were spending on feed. And he asks two things. Should you let your chickens forage? Will that help in your feed costs? And what about soaking the feed? So first let's talk about foraging. Yes, foraging will reduce feed consumption, especially if you force forage your birds. You move them a lot so they have access to new fresh areas to forage where there's more bugs. 
Uh, letting chickens go through your cow poops is a great way to get them extra protein. I have literally seen maggots crawling out of cow poops and wished that the chickens were there to peck them off because that would be free feed. So absolutely let your chickens forage. If you monitored their feed closer, feeding them just barely what they need, you would encourage them to forage more. Think about it this way. If I plop down a big basket of french fries and said, here, you can eat this, or you can walk through the woods and try to find some mushrooms, what are you going to do to feed yourself lunch? Well, you're probably going to eat the basket of french fries. Maybe then you'd go looking for a mushroom or two. Instead, if I said, hey, go find a bunch of mushrooms for lunch, and for dinner I'll give you the french fries, well, if that's the case, you're just going to be super unhealthy. The point is, we should feed our birds later in the day, forcing them to go forage, fill up their bellies with whatever they can find, and then providing the supplements they need. But that is a management issue. Time, uh, just the routine, making sure if you're going to limit feed, you have to be really on top of your process, making sure you don't skip a feeding. We've always given our chickens just free range to feed because once in a while, instead of going to do the morning chores, at eight o'clock exactly, we'll go fishing in the morning and we won't get home till 10. And then if we messed up the birds feeding, it could cause worse problems. If you're really regimented and you're there every day, same time, exactly perfect, you can limit the feed, force forage, and things can go well. If you're not super regimented, sometimes this will shoot you in the foot because your chickens will start to go hungry because maybe you forgot to feed them one morning because you were out fishing and then you got home and then you're like, oh no, my chickens need feed. And now they're in starvation mode and they stop producing eggs. So you can shoot yourself in the foot. Let them forage and you know, let them feed. Foraging can help either way. Now let's go to the soaking part because this is the part that I totally was going to answer one thing and then I just changed my mind. Well, I didn't change my mind. Science did. You know I'm a big fan of science learning about, you know, what has been proven by good quality scientific studies and using that scientific information to base a lot of my decisions on. It's not because I think science is perfect and it never gets anything wrong because if you look at the history of science and what we thought was true 10 years ago and 30 years ago and 100 years ago, uh, science is not a perfect science. It's a work in progress constantly. However, if you're going to make decisions, I think it makes sense to look at the most recent studies, the most recent information out there, and base your decisions on that information and not uh, anecdotal evidence from your favorite YouTube channel, your favorite vlogger. If I said to you, oh, you know what, I did this with my chickens and look, they look so much better, that's not scientific. So if I said to you, oh, we soak all our feed and look, our chickens look awesome, that's not good data. And it was my opinion when I read that question, ah, this whole soaking feed thing, it's one of those ferment, those crazy fermenters at it again, trying to soak everything in the world. Bunch of super soakers. I couldn't help it. I loved super soakers as a kid. Before I answered the question though, I wanted to see if there was good scientific data on this because I didn't want to poo-poo something only to find out later I was wrong. Well, guess what? I was wrong. There have been some good scientific studies that have found soaking chicken feed does help the chicken in a bunch of different ways, which equals Dun, da, 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 reduced feed amounts, like Mr. Potato had asked. So here's what happens. Scientists soaked chicken feed. They poured it water into the feed. They let it ferment for a couple days. One day, two day, three day. You can let things ferment by the natural yeasts in the air. You can add yeast to it. You can add uh, brewer's yeast. You can put apple cider vinegar in. There's a lot of different ways to get you know the right enzymes chewing things up and get the whole process started. Now this, let me just tell you, is not science speak. I, I'm not, I'm just telling you what I read. I haven't done the study. I'm, I might mispronounce one thing, but the general information here is what I read from these studies this morning. So what they found was when they soaked the feed over a couple days, those, that fermenting process starts, the grains in the feed become more digestible uh, that means it's easier for the chicken to get the nutrients they need from that feed. Also was better on their immune system. There was less bacteria found at the other end, the chicken poop, in the crops. 
all in all, fermenting the feed, while didn't actually make the chicken lay more eggs because the chicken has so many eggs in its body, period, and it's going to lay the amount it has there as long as you know they're healthy and they feel safe, they'll keep laying eggs. And it actually did delay the egg laying process in the beginning. So chicken A was fed regular dry feed, it started laying eggs sooner. Chicken B, fermented feed, it took longer for chicken B to start laying. The eggs that came out of chicken B, the fermented super soaker chicken, those eggs had a harder shell. They were a little bit bigger, just a little bit, and they laid as much as chicken A. So equal chickens, slightly bigger eggs, same amount of eggs, but super soaker chicken needed less feed to produce the same amount of eggs. They saw a reduction in feed. Now, I don't remember if it was 30%. I'll have a link below to two studies that I looked at that were very interesting and quick and easy reads. Not easy, but quick reads. The point is, if you want to reduce price, cost, you could ferment your feeds and see that actually happen. That's what the scientists found happened. They needed less feed for the same results and they had healthier chickens. So that's good, less feed, same amount of eggs in the long run, healthier chickens. I like that. To the point where it's got me thinking, I might actually try this. This is another one of those areas where it will add to the workload. It means instead of just scooping out the feed, pouring it in every day, we'll have to add a couple of fermenting jars. And they found better results with longer ferments. So not just one day, but three days was what they said suggested fermenting for three days. So taking a scoop of feed, putting it in a jar with some water, putting some like a cheesecloth over the top of it, and then leaving it there for three days, which means you have to get the chain started. Do that, the next day do that again. Meanwhile, you're still feeding the chicken's dry feed. Then on the third day, you can take the one that you fermented, pour it in the chicken's mash now, you know, in their bucket, let them eat that. This would also be a good way to monitor monitor the amount of feed you give the chicken. So if you're force foraging your chickens, Make sure you just ferment the exact amount they need for a day, which is a quarter of a pound per egg laying chicken. For us right now, we have about 35 chickens, closer with the ducks and everything to 40. That means we're going through about 10 pounds of feed, a little bit less per day. So we're, could, we could take a bucket full of 10 pounds of feed, pour in the water. I believe the ratio is a 10 for every three parts. So that would be three pounds of water with 10 pounds of feed. Leave it in a bucket with cheesecloth over the top for three days and then pour that exact out amount for the chickens and do it at the end of the day so they have to force forage all day. If we did all that, we may see a reduction in the amount of feed that they need. We might see better quality eggs and uh, overall, it might be better for the Bluebird Egg Company. I might try this. And this is why this I love doing these Q&As because I don't know everything out there about homesteading. I have only been doing this for seven years now, going on our, well, actually, this is our eighth year in the works. That is a long time to some of you, and that is a very short time to others of you watching. And when we do this Q&A, we get audiences asking questions, suggesting things. We get lots of tips like this, which help us learn more and become a better source of information. Because of Mr. Potato Head, I now know more about chickens than I did when I woke up this morning. So thank you, Mr. Potato Head, for cluing us into that and making me look into this further and thank all of you who submit questions. Remember, if you want questions answered, hashtag Ask Homesteady so that I can find them. And if you wanna make sure that we are every week here doing Ask Homesteady along with our four other videos every weekday released at five, become a Homesteady Pioneer. We so appreciate it and we can't do this show without you. For more reasons than just being a pioneer, one of the reasons being you're teaching us about super soaker chickens. Thanks for watching and we will see you next week. We have some good videos planned already in the works and we can't wait to show them to you. We'll be here Monday at five o'clock p.m. Eastern time every day, every weekday, five o'clock p.m. Eastern time with another video. Thanks to all our pioneers and all you who don't skip the ads like the one that's about to play right now.